But I didn't fully understand the cause But there are saints throughout the ages And there are those today Who show us what it really means To carry the cross And that only fuels my devotion know what you believe this morning? Did you come with something in your heart? See, I figured out over the last little bit that if you don't know what you believe, that people will feel you full of a lot that you can believe if you choose to believe that. But I've also found out that you also kind of need to know what you know so that when somebody comes at you with something, you know how to sort of discern what's true and what's not and that you can actually tell them where you stand. You know, if we're not going to be faithful to what God called us to do, then we don't even need to do it. You know, Buck taught a lesson this morning about um, Proverbs, the virtuous woman, and, you know, if we're not going to commit to things, if we're not going to even try, then why are we here? Why did you come to church this morning? Why did you get up? Did you come because you knew the preacher was going to call you when you got home? Some of you, we, we might need to raise our hand and say, yep. 
Did you come just because you had a nagging spouse or child or somebody that said, or parent that said, you got to get up, we got to go? You know, we, we need to think about our motives because I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know that we got a whole lot more time to sit around and think about stuff like this. You know, I, I'm looking at what's happening in this world, and I, I, if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, it has been so far in the 53 years that I've been here. It's been true every day. I believe that we're going to see some things over the next little bit, the next year or so, that, that is going to let us know that God is not that far away. And I don't think, I think some of us are waiting, for, you know, we're, we're kind of like the person when it tells you the lane's going to end on the highway instead of getting on over. We think we're going to run down there and somebody's going to let us squeeze in, but, but I'm not sure that the squeezing principle is going to work with the gates of heaven. We might need to look at that today. I look at your faces, you know, I stand up here and I sing and y'all see me when I look up there. It's because I can see the angels and I can see old Jordan Shore up there. I look at you and I see, a, I see just, I don't know. It makes me scared. Yeah. Well, well, hallelujah. You just, we just need to remember, guys, that God gave us a joy. We don't need to let Satan steal that joy. And we need to worship him and thank him for all he's done. I don't know what we're going to do one day when we get to heaven, but we said we're going to stand around the throne and just worship all day long. We're going to be in trouble, aren't we, the Baptist anyway? <laughs> we're going to be in trouble. How many of you are glad that, that he's risen? How many of you are glad that you're going to get to see him one day? Let's all stand and sing our offertory hymn, Because He Lives. That will be our offertory hymn. Oh, fear is- 
bondage of sin anymore. I'm still amazed that Jesus would pay a debt I could not afford. I've never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. I still feel as much as when he first touched me. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. I'm still in all that he gave it all for an old sinner like me. And I never got over that this king would shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. This stranger would accept a manger in trade for a kingly throne. I'm still at a loss why he take the cross instead of a street of pure gold. Well, he's the only king who gave everything in exchange for a cold, dark grave. I still love to ponder. Yesterday, in Alabama for the next two weeks, and it got canceled. And uh, But I just wanted you to throw that out there so you could. Matthew chapter 4, and we'll begin with verse 17. Uh, in just a moment. It's good to see y'all. I do want to issue a word of caution uh, as far as coronavirus is concerned. Uh, uh, it's very active in Columbus County, and so all I can do is encourage you. Uh, in the Church of God down the road here, they have quite a number in there who have the virus, so uh, it's, it's still very active. And it's a very sickening type thing, and it's also very deadly uh, if you have certain conditions. So, kind of follow some sensibility type things, and well, only less than 0.1 percent are dying from this disease. Is a foolish way to think. Just look at this congregation this morning. What if you were that person who was so careless? 
came to church with the coronavirus because it may be to you it was a sniffle or a light fever. Or Mr. Roger or Miss Darkers or myself or, or Lawyer or Judy, we died in two or three weeks because we got it from your bringing it and your carelessness. That's how serious this stuff really is. It may not be serious to you who have no underlying conditions and are healthy and strong, but it's dead serious to the elderly. And so uh, that's why we need to be protective as we can, uh, one to another. And I think it'll, it'll help. Uh, if I'm out in the public, I wear a mask. I don't wear it here uh, because I can't talk very well through a mask, but I, I wear a mask. I, wash, I have hand cleaner in my truck, and I immediately wash my hands uh, in hand cleaner and wear that mask. So that's up to you. It's a, you. We don't live in a communist nation where you're told everything you have to do. Do what? How about that? Is that better? Praise the Lord. All right. Matthew chapter 17. I'm chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, we find these words. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now we know that Jesus called 12 disciples and all one of them being a the devil. But today we want to talk about, first of all, we want to talk about Jesus' intention, his command and his commission to us that we need to repent. And then his choosing us as his children. And then how are we to live after we have been chosen to be the children of God? Now, if you, were, if you were to offer people free tickets into any amusement park, to any uh, country show or whatever thing you might like, you would gladly take them. But I just want to tell you something. While salvation is the free gift of God, it's not a free ride. It's a free gift of God, and, and there's no charge and no work that we could ever do and no righteousness that we could ever attain that will get us to glory apart from uh, the Jesus Christ dying on the cross at Calvary and paying that debt of sin that we could confess our sins. That is repentance. That we would, we would realize. And, and so uh, this morning we want to talk about all that. Now I don't go home with y'all. I go home with Judy. And, I, and my children live near me and, I, and we intermesh together because of, of, of we eat together and that kind of stuff, and we're family, so to speak. But I, I kind of know how my family is living. I don't know how you live, and I don't know how you think on a daily basis. But Buck, and several times in our Sunday school this morning, uh, talking about the issue of the heart. And, and what goes on in the heart is exactly where the Lord is listening and where the Lord is looking in that scripture. And he says that uh, when he looks at our heart, he sees the corruptness of men. Because if the heart is impure, then everything about us is impure. If the heart has not been cleansed and washed as it ought to be in rebirth, uh, then we will be an unclean people. You remember that uh, the prophet said, I am a man of unclean lips. I have come from a people of unclean lips. Therefore, the Lord took a hot coal, or the angel took a hot coal off the altar and went and burned the tongue. Literally speaking, that's that cleansing. Fire is a cleansing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. The cleansing of our hearts by God himself is what enables us to be born again and to go to heaven. We have taught five weeks, I believe, or four weeks. On Wednesday night, we have talked about the straight gate and the broad way. We have talked about heaven and hell. We, we are on hell. I thought we'd finish last Wednesday, but we didn't. But this Wednesday, we'll try to uh, get through with hell. And, and, and we have tried to be as clear and as, 
and as plain as we possibly can uh, because these are real entities. The Bible gives us the measurements of heaven. It told in John as he wrote down what was given him in Revelation, uh, they were told to measure this way and to measure that way and to measure that way, and they'll be that tall, that wide. Everything will be square. All the walls are square in heaven, and there will be sufficient room in within that framework of heaven uh, that they will contain the souls of the saints and contain the saints themselves. And we are one day, uh, for those who are going to heaven, we'll go to heaven. And for those who are not going to heaven, uh, we'll go to hell. That's going to be the termination of this life as we know it. This will be the termination of the Genesis creation as we know it. For then will be a new heaven and a new earth. And then we'll see a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. There's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a complete different environment than we know it. And so it, we muse at the world that we live in. We, we, uh, we are all against homosexuality, but we support businesses who send money to support these organizations. We say that, that we are against uh, abortion, but we vote in congressmen and congress ladies who believe in abortion. And so it, we, everything seemingly that, that we say we believe in, we contradict it by doing things just like that. We, we say that we are against sin, but we hang around with sinners. What fellowship hath light and darkness? And over and again, we're told this through the Scripture. I warned the teenagers, and, and now they're young men and women. I warned them, don't date women that are not Christians. I was just sitting here this morning uh, thinking about some young people that are not here, and when, as soon as they got 18 and got a truck, they're gone. Or got a boyfriend and took them another direction. What in God's name have you been getting in church all these years? You just ain't been listening. You were here because you had to be here. And, and so uh, when, and now the time has come. You don't have to be here. And you look at the choice that they made, and it tells you what they got when they were here. They were just killing time until the time had come that they could tell their mom or their daddy, they I ain't coming no more. Do you all understand that? Do y'all understand that some of you younger than that age that are sitting here right now is going to do the same thing? You're going to do it because you can do it. You Because we have a rebellious spirit in us. And we're going to rebel because that rebellious spirit. Save, we, we let God break that rebellious spirit. Right now, I have four great grandbabies. Every one of them, except the youngest one of them, is going through that stage where they're having to be broken. They're having to be broken. That spirit in them to rebel against authority. That spirit to rebel against what they're told to do is, is, is in there. That's the Bible calls that stiff neck. The Bible calls it hard-hearted. This stiff neck people refuse to obey God. He said it over and over again. And, and we say, well, that past, they're gone now. No, we're still here. We still are hard-hearted and stiff-necked. We still are going to do like Elvis Presley and live it out our way. We repeat ourselves over and over and over again. We repeat ourselves. It just And Satan is there to encourage us to repeat the way we live. And so today... Uh, first of all, we want to talk about uh, uh, so these three things. We're just going I want to try to help you is all I want to do. And if it don't help you, I've wasted the day and the morning. But I want to try to help you in living your life because it's important how we live our life. It's very important uh, to you. Others will benefit if you live your life the way you ought to. But it's especially important to you. Carelessness is a terrible thing, and carelessness uh, is deadly, 
and we need to be careful. And so, uh, at first of all, uh, the Lord, uh, when he came to preach, he, he brought repentance. He brought a message of repentance. Now, listen to me. How did you know when you needed to repent? At some point in time, if you are here today, and you're a Christian, you had to come to the realization, I've got something in my life that I need to repent of. That means that ask God to forgive me. And, and, and ask God to, to help me, to cleanse me. So at some point in time, we have to come to the realization that we need to repent. If we don't, we don't never repent. We don't never turn from, from the wicked way that the Bible talks about, that we need to leave the wicked way. The evil way. The way is sin. I, can I tell you all something? Uh, we put, a, we put a, a red ribbon on sin. It is fun to sin. In fact, it's more fun to sin than sitting in a boring Sunday school class. If you still got the world sin nature in you. It's more fun to, uh, to, to be at the lake today with a boat spinning around all over the lake or at the beach with your favorite uh, beach chair just laying there with your cooler over there drinking Pepsi or Sun Drop, whatever you drink. It's more fun to be there than to be setting up in an old stuffy church house with a bunch of stuffy people that you don't like anyway. And, and so it's more fun to be out there. That's a person who needs repentance. See, that's, that's the whole deal. That's the whole thing. But somehow or another, we think we have figured life out. Well, I want you to know that one who has lived for a few years, you, it'll take you a long time before you get life figured out. And just at the time you think you have, uh, you'll realize you didn't know what it was about anyway. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, when you get old and can't do, it's easy to give up some of the things you do now. Sin wise. When you when you get old and the, and the sparkle ain't in your eye no more, uh, it's very easy to quit doing some of the things you're doing now. Uh, but don't wait till it's easy for you. Why don't you do it today while God can can forgive you of your sins? Because his spirit will not always strive with man. His spirit will not always be there to, to nurture you to know you need to repent. Because that's Genesis 5. If y'all want to read that, it's right in there. He said, I will not, my spirit will not always strive with the Adam, Eve generation. Because look what they're doing. Uh, they're, just look at the perverseness already in our land in just a short time from these people that I cast out of the garden. And when you think about that stuff, uh, that, that's not. I, I was thinking the other day, where could people get the idea about, well, you know, I, yeah, I sat down sometimes and I, and I try to picture this. Listen, here's what I try to picture. What does God look, the Bible said he's not a spirit. All right, here I go. I, I, I'm trying to have a look into heaven. I'm sitting out here in the pew and I want to look into heaven. The Bible said that there's four and 20 elders that are sitting on thrones. They're on thrones, but in front of them is, is God. And on his throne, he said, and beside of him on the right-hand side is my Savior, the Lord. I try to picture that. Yeah, what? Jesus Christ came, and, and he had a beard and long hair, and he was a Jew, and he was, a, he was the Son of God, and he became the Savior of the world, but there's God. And he, God is not a, a man that, that I can say he's got long hair. And he, what does God look like? You ever think about what God looks like? I think about that, and I say, well, if he don't look like a man, I mean, and all of a sudden, if you ain't careful, doubt will start creeping into your mind. How can this mess all be real? That's what people have done. They, they, how can it all be real? How can by the death of one, many be saved? How, how can it possibly be? What is it, it different about his blood? It's, it's that perfect lamb blood. That's what's different about it. It started off in the sacrificial system. Don't get a, a lamb out there that's infected with some disease and bring it. Bring the purest that you have. Bring the fattest that you have. Bring the best that you have. And that's what God did. He sent his son. 
the best that he had to redeem us of the unredeemable if he didn't come. Our sin. And so Jesus, when he first thing, he, he beckoned, he says, repent. Look, I want to back up here and just read a little something in this chapter. I want you to just listen here what's going on here. It says, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the border of Zebulun and Naphtali. Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. Jesus, listen, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, Light is sprung up. This dreadful region of the country where it was death was so uh, imminent, they, when Jesus came to light, and that light became life to men. And these people who were damned and doomed to death because of the evilness of their heart now had a greater hope. And listen what it says. It says, in de- it says region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Repent. Repent was, was, is the message. Repent means to turn away from your sin. If you repent without turning, you haven't repented. You have, you have done a Catholic sacrilege. You have kissed the rosaries. Is all you've done. You have not repented until you turn away from your sin. And not just turn away, but the lust of those things. You turn away. For the scripture has plainly written, we are dead to sin. A dead man does not lust after a woman. A dead man does not lust after drug or alcohol. A dead man does not lust after wealth and fame. Dead men don't lust after anything. Dead men are dead except the newness of life that comes because We are in Christ, and we can only live because he lives. We can only face tomorrow because he lives. And so, uh, why do we make the repetitive mistakes? Why are we on it? Because we came to him, we said we repented, but we didn't turn away from what we repented of. Therefore, we have not yet repented. The potential in us is to be wicked and evil. That's an old sin nature. That we brought that forward from Adam. We brought it forward, and our nature is to do that. But you know what? There is a time of repentance when, when all that we have brought forward, that, it is, that old nature is once again hidden in Christ, and we need it. We need it. We need it more than anything. And I'm going to tell you something. There's been many accolades in the last several weeks from some of the greatest doctors and some of the greatest uh, uh, leaders and politicians about children being out of school. It is absolutely having a social effect on children. It is going to impact their life as much as not having parents. The social integration that we have through school is very important in the development of children and young people. Many of them have already turned to habits. Many of them are are in that violence you see in the streets around our nation. They have already uh, uh, found themselves in gangs, and things are already changing. And and I'm going to tell you something. Child abuse is rampant because it's not being reported because they're out of school. We have all kinds of issues going on. But you know what? The average one of you this morning are not thinking about those families that are going through that hell. You're just thinking about your little group. And you could care less about what's going on. Many of you will not even go to the polls and vote. Because you, uh, my friend, have neglected it so long you'll continue to neglect it. But yet you'll gripe the whole year through. 
And that's the way it is. Complain about what we're doing at church, but you don't come very much to try to help change it. So Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This, this, this statement is at a hand is used twice in, in the New Testament. I, I just want you all to understand something. We, Michelle said it in her, this morning in her little introductory thing there. Uh, you know, I believe the end of time is drawing near. And, and, you, and you see, that was right just by virtue that last weekend it was drawing near, but it's nearer today than it was last weekend. So that's always a true statement. We're closer now than when we began. So we're closer. And so every day brings us closer to the Lord, brings us closer to meeting Him, to having an encounter of encounters like we never had. Oftentimes when you're having a, uh, like the yam, they'll have a yam encounter for the yam festival. They'll have a strawberry encounter for the strawberry. But nothing will ever equal or measure to the encounter we're going to have when we see the Lord. For those that are not ready, it'll be a frightful encounter. But for those that are ready, it'll be a reunion encounter where everybody rejoices and praise the Lord. Do y'all understand, uh, folks, that when Jesus said repent, uh, repent to, from what to what? Repent from your sins. Repent from your sins. Y'all, everybody knows what sin is. That, that nature has been created you when God was in that baby delivery room that you were born in. He breathed into you the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And it's in you. There, it's in you. you. You innately know right and wrong. That's why a child, listen, a child will go over to a coffee table, put her, his little hand on it, and look at the authority figures because he knows he's putting his hand in the wrong place. But you big daddies and mamas, you put your hand in mess and don't never look because that same authority, that spiritual father in heaven is looking at you and you leave your hand where you know your hand ought not to be. And that's the greater sin. For he who knoweth to do right and doeth it not, his sin. But Jesus said, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, it's upon you now. He has come. It's, the now is the time to repent. He's, it's at hand. Salvation, while it's called today, don't pass by because we don't have another day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of hope. We need to reach out for hope because it's called today. We don't need to put it off another time. I can remember when I was in boot camp, and, and I know the Navy boot camp's not like the Army boot camp. The Army boot camp's out in the woods. The Navy boot camp was on a concrete surface somewhere. We marched and did all that mess. But one of the things we had to do was we had to wash our own clothes by hand. And we, they gave you a brush and some Tide or whatever you get over there at the, when you check in in your bag and, and get, you got these tables about here and everybody at night would be in there scrub. and when you sweat in the band of a white hat or, or that kind of stuff and you underground you had to sit over there and scrub all that stuff and I'm going to tell you something uh, when uh, when the when the guy you, we call him the com company commander uh, came around he checked your how well you had cleaned your stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. If there was any dirt left in that hat band, anything, he'd throw it down on the floor and stomp it. We, what we've done today and what the church has allowed with a non-disciplinary system in the church, we have allowed people to walk around with a dirty soul because they are not doing and scrubbing and clean. They have not been fully washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, because they're wearing dirty garments. 
I want you to know, and, and we'd be standing out there at attention, and you'd have to pull that hat off and present that hat, and the inside and around that. We did, and I'm a sweater, and I, because I knew by the time I marched out there and got there, I, mine was going to be messed up, up soiled because I just am. That's what I am. And I'd pull that thing off, and I'd stand there trembling because I knew he was going to see dirt in it. And that's the way we ought to be before the Lord today. We ought to stand trembling that the Lord's going to see that dirt in our life. He's going to see that sin that we've been said we've been washed up, that sin that we've been delivered from as we stand before him holding that hat, spiritual hat, in our hand, and all he can see is the dirt around the band. Repent, he said. Repent. Turn from your sin and turn to him. And it's the next point that we're going to is absolutely amazing to me. Uh, he, when he, he said in verse 19, he said, follow me. He just didn't walk by, hey, yeah, yeah, y'all come on. Yeah, you boys been coming right regular. I think y'all make good deacons. Come on. No, he didn't say that. He, first thing, he, when he walked by him, he said, repent. Church leadership needs to be a repented bunch. A bunch that have repented and then turned to Jesus to follow Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, all this stuff that, that's going on in our churches would cease the very moment we get uh, church leadership uh, in our churches across the land that have repented and turned to follow Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Jesus was angered by what was going on in the temple. And he expressed his anger by destroying the tables and taking a cat of nine tails and driving the people out that were, were abusing and profaning the house of prayer. We don't have that in our churches anymore. I'll tell you, they weren't to have dump trucks hauling sand to the front door because we come looking like we're on our way to the beach, because we act like we're in a bar environment. We want the same music that they play at the House of Blues and that they play all over Myrtle Beach. We want to live like the world, but yet we want to be identified as people on their way to heaven. I just want to tell you something today. You better get over that because that's in your past. You are not going to get to heaven looking like you look and acting like you like and doing like you're doing I want you to know it takes repentance turning away from and turning to Jesus say amen well <laughs> praise the Lord anyway amen but we have that we repent from that stuff and that's what Jesus wanted Jesus wanted us to do that. He wanted us to turn from sin. That's the call. You remember the cry of the people when Peter and the son, they came down from in Acts and, and, and they, he, they preached and the people cried out with a voice of unity, what shall we do? That, that's why we need to preach the gospel. You know, you know what Peter preached? He preached more than the fact that they had crucified Christ. He went back there and he told them, you and your fathers and, and your whole family members, here's how y'all have lived. You've lived like hell. You, you've lived like hell and it brought you to the point. You would have never crucified Jesus if you come from a Christian home. You'd have never crucified Jesus if you had instruction that he was the Son of God. You'd have never crucified him, and the same applies to y'all. You wouldn't go out of these church doors and go to your fellowship of friends and crucify Jesus if you were born again. So don't try to tell me you're born again. When your fellowship is with people that are not born again. Don't try to tell me that stuff. It's a lie, a livable lie. But you know what? They show fish swimming in the ocean. A big whale will have several little leeches, hang, leech type fish hanging on to him. Every ship has barnacles that's in the ocean. Never seen so many. When they took our ship out of the water and you see the barnacles, you just won't believe how they grow uh, in, on that ship. And the, I saw the sharks and, and big whales, and they'll have other fish that have stuck to them. 
And, and I want you to know, Christ don't want us to be a leech. We, he don't want us running riding him up and down the road, sucking the blood out of him when, when we haven't repented. Do y'all understand that this morning? This part-time playboy game that you got going on in your life, play in church in the name of Jesus Christ, quit playing your games. When your heart is right, you will ever have a heart full of praise. When your heart is right, you can't help but raise your hand. You can't help but holler out. You can't help it because you, when you walk that close to the Lord, can't help it. You can't help it. Did, I, did you hear me? What did I say? You can't help it. Following Jesus. Can I tell you something? The best I can read and discern and, and in the Scripture, and the Bible says study to show yourself approved. I've read this thing over several times, and I ain't got it all now, but I, I, the best I can, I can discern out of this Scripture, here's some things that I have discerned. And when, when we follow Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ didn't want our life to be full of bored and full of, full of nothing. It ought to be the greatest joy of our life to realize that we've entered the portal, that we are heir and joint heir with Jesus Christ. That we are one day going to a land where there's no sin, no pain, nothing of that stuff. That we can assure, I look at my little great-grandbabies and I say, God, let me live in such a way that I can lead them before I leave here or lead their parents that they, they can have the, uh, at least the opportunity to to repent of their sin and to join me in heaven someday. That's what I pray for them. And they're so smart and wise anymore, uh, you know, and, and they'll, you, you can tell them, that, and they'll just start asking questions, even at, as little children, as small as mine are. Uh, uh, what does that mean, Papa? And go, just go deeper and deeper. So if you parents will get your children here, and your grandchildren here, we got teachers that will tell them about Jesus, and they'll ask questions about him. And they'll get told who Jesus is and how that they as children. That's the whole deal. You can't do it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How will you hear without a preacher? Do y'all not read the Bible, the script? Oh, you read the parts you want to hear. You read the parts that justify absence and doing what you do. Justify your ways. That's not following Christ. Christ never justified anything but the will of God. Even when his death came up, he said, Nonetheless, Father, not my will, but your will is what I want to do. I want to follow you and what you said do. I want to work the works you work. I want to walk the way you walk. I want to read the words that you said are important. I want to study. I want to be that. That's following Jesus. And Jesus, if you'll jump ahead in your study, if you'll hear what he said, they will come to me and they say unto me, and, and, and they, they'll come to me and I say unto them, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was cold, you put a coat on me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Lord, I didn't do that. That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you, Jesus said. Depart from me, you worker of iniquities. That's following Jesus Christ. You will do the things he does. I don't like little slogans and mess like that, but I'm going to tell you that WWJD come mighty close. What would Jesus do ought to be the in prevalent in the front of our minds even when we're at a restaurant ordering food? Everything we do ought to be, that ought to be in the presence of our mind as Christian people. Choosing a university. 
to educate ourselves. Oh, I want to go over there. That's where my friends are. That's why I want to go there. Right? Praise the Lord. Don't, the Lord ain't got nothing to do with it. Did y'all know that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is one of the most liberal universities in the country? I got blue hats at the house, blue shirts and everything else. I'm telling you right now, but I've grown up and I'm beginning to realize they got great basketball and they got great this, but I want to tell you they got great liberal teaching that is taking our young people away from the teaching of the Word of God and taking them to another part of our society. So it doesn't matter. Have you prayed about where you're going? Have you prayed about what college you need to go to? Have you prayed about what boy or girl you need to date? Have you prayed about it, or are they just pretty or handsome, and you're going to date them whether God allows it or not? What if your friend says, I, I don't go to church, I don't want you to go? What if your wife says that and you've, you're a husband that's been raised up in church? What if your husband says that and you're a wife that's been raised up in church and one of you say to the other, well, I don't want to go. You go ahead if you want to. I don't want to go. I just can't this. I just can't that. Lord gives you children and the children become a stumbling block for you because you think you'd rather stay home with the children than bring them and, put, and try to teach them how to discipline themselves in the church. You're not willing to put forth that effort. You ought not to even have a baby. If that's the way you feel. God ought not to even have blessed your womb. If you're not willing to, to dare put your soul on the line. And let them cry. My God, is that not what babies do? Do your best. Nurture them. Make sure they're not uncomfortable. But for God's sakes, don't keep them home because they're babies. That's where they need to be in church. These little fellas ever learning. And I know, man, I'm telling you, time flies by when God is trying to speak and nurture hearts, doesn't it? Repentance is turning from our sin to turning to Jesus Christ, walking with Jesus Christ. And then the Scripture offers another challenge, and it says, now that I am a, a Christian, what should I do? How should I live? What should my conversation be? Most living in America is out of control living. Since the advent of plastic cards, we call them credit cards, people have lived carelessly financially and have found themselves in very deep holes in debt because we don't think about it. We just swipe it, sign it, swipe it, sign it, swipe. And so now companies have formed around that. I forgot what the trillion dollar value is of the credit card debt of America today. But it's, it's out of this world. It could fight wars if we could put it all together. And, pe and so people are distressed over that. But now these companies have raised up around it and said, did you know that you can be, if you owe more than this many thousand, you can be forgiven. You just call us and we can get all that forgiven. Did you know that in Revelation it says no thief is going to enter into the kingdom of God? And I'm telling you, William, it means it. No thief is going to go to heaven. That's a thief that'll, that'll, that'll owe a man a debt and not pay it. That is a thief. No thief is going to go to heaven. Along with liars, drunkenness, and all that other stuff. But how ought we to live? You see, uh, because Facebook and, and the news media uh, show us a way to sin, don't mean we got to take that way to sin. 
in a recent election in New York, mail-in votes, and, and everybody's criticizing our president for, for fussing about mail-in votes. Just mail them out and let them mail. They had uh, several dogs and cats vote. Several cats and dogs voted. A lot of people vote every season of, in the graveyards. They, they go around, you see people out there with a notepad. They're getting their names and they're putting them on ballots and they vote every year, every time elections are held. That's how what we're willing to do to win. That's what we're willing to commit whatever sin. Commit whatever sin to win. We want to be on the winning end of the conversation instead of repenting. Paul began in Romans 12, and he explained it kind of this way. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the tender mercies of God, that you would present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And then in, in verse 6, he goes on to say, uh, don't, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Uh, God forbid, how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into his death are also risen with him in newness of life? And so there's a different life. We live resurrected life, and we don't live in sin. We don't run after sin, but sin runs after you, but you don't have to be caught by it. Resist the devil, and what will he do? Flee from you. Draw nigh to God, what will he do? Draw nigh to you. Call on the Lord, he may be found. Seek, and you may find him. Knock, and he's a, he'll open the door. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. Ask, and you shall receive. Jesus says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll do it for you. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, the, these, these prayers on Facebook are empty requests. They are empty. Look at here. Get on your telephone and call your pastor, your deacons, your neighbors and your friends that you trust. Don't spread it on Facebook. That you want people to pray. I don't want you praying for me if you ain't living right. I don't want your prayers. Please don't call my name. Because I'll tell you, God ain't hearing you no way. You're wasting your breath and your time if you're praying for me and you're not living like you ought to live. Hello? So let's don't waste our time at all. Well, I, I got a cousin that got in the wreck. I got a, a, a friend at the work. Oh, pray. Hey, you got to pray. Everybody, hey, we need a magnitude of prayer right now. Bull! We ain't been to church in weeks and months. Hey, why do you need prayer all of a sudden? That, that's the way we've learned Christianity. We can be the hypocrites of hypocrites and, and expect everything from God. We think God's going to send us an EBT card, and we use it when we want it. Jesus said, repent. The kingdom's at hand, Jennifer. Jesus said, he saw these men, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll never get over. And I'm getting near, so if you want to come on, you can come. But I'll never get over. Jesus Christ dying for people like me. I won't never get over that he was an innocent man he never committed a sin but yet they killed him And then he, here's, here's the catcher right here. Here's why we, like them people there, they followed him. But here's why, here's why we don't follow him. Because he said, if you live godly and follow me, you're going to get the same medicine. I 
I got a word of advice for you. You young people, I know we got uh, Addison's going to be a senior, and we got some sophomores and juniors, and got some college students. You know, I got I got a word of advice for you. Don't date with nobody. Don't don't. And if you divorced, same information applies. Don't run around with women and men and boys and girls that that just don't live for God. All you're doing is demeaning yourself and your name. Amen. Isaiah wrote about it, wrote about the ass, said that donkey, that's a donkey, donkey tied to the barn's got more sense than a human being. At least they know when to quit. Human beings don't know when to quit. They just keep on sinning. Keep on pouring it on. Keep on running with it. Look, you, you guys can find somebody that loves Jesus Christ. I mean, they, they got, can't be ashamed of it. When you're in the car together, just you and them talk about Jesus. Can't be ashamed of Jesus. If you're following Jesus, you've got to follow him 100%. Follow Jesus. Don't make Jesus feel like he's just a necessity that you hang on to because you might get sick or you might have a need. Let him feel like you love him so much that you would never leave nor forsake him as he promised to do for you. Would you please stand to your feet?